FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network, and perhaps you might even be watching it. Hey, this is Kerry Lutz. Today's February 5th, 2018. Well, we've been watching the markets. Stock markets romp has continued. On to today, the Bitcoin cryptocurrency romp has continued today. Uh, Bitcoin trading under $7,100. No surprises there. Anything that goes up that fast has got to be headed for a crash. Not a permanent crash by any stretch, at least in my humble opinion. Uh, but person you're about to hear from, the founder of the Anarchapulco conference coming up next week. And oh, by the way, email us, be part of the show. KL at Kerry Lutz is the email address. His name is Jeff Berwick and Dollar Vigilante is his site. Jeff, we've been talking for years. Great to have you back on. Yeah, it's great to talk with you, Kerry. Hey, well, I caught you last week, but you were like so... You were in and out. I couldn't uh, connect with you, but you were at the North American Bitcoin Conference. What did you think of that get together? Uh, I found it interesting. I actually mentioned during my speech that when I heard there was 4,000 people there, that it seemed like it was the top of the market. And I think <laughs> I pretty much nailed that. Uh, and that is very, uh, the thing that's interesting to me, Carrie, is I've been in these these sort of markets, not just crypto, obviously, but uh, internet yeah. stocks. Uh, I was involved in the tech bubble. So I've seen a lot of these sort of bubbles. And yes, the crypto is a, a, a bubble. Uh, it has been a bubble for, for a little while now. Uh, where it stops exactly, that's the question. But, uh, you know, all these bubbles are caused by central bank money printing. But for me personally, I've gone through so many of these now that it, it's always becoming quite obvious. So when I first heard that I was going to the, the North American Bitcoin Conference, which I spoke at uh, years ago, I think about three or four years ago, and there maybe there was a few hundred people there. Uh, very, you know, we were the crazy guys talking about crazy stuff <laughs> back when Bitcoin was probably around $100 or something like that, or maybe two or $300. And um, when I heard that uh, the North American Bitcoin conference was sold out at 4,000 people, and I think tickets were like 1000 or $2,000, you can do the math on how much money they made at that event. Uh, and uh, I, I did my speech there, and it was a very large auditorium with a lot of people. And to me, yeah, it really signified that uh, this was probably uh, getting very close to the top, uh, you know, short or medium term top of the market. Definitely, as you mentioned, not long term top. This isn't the end of cryptocurrencies, but uh, th they needed a lot of cooling off after what was a crazy year in 2017. Oh, it was madness. You know, it went up 1400% in 2017. And the problem is like, you saw the market participants, Jeff, they're young, unseasoned, don't understand what money really is, don't really know about inflation. They're a lot less sophisticated than people throwing around that much money should be. They were a kind of a naive lot. And, you know, they hadn't uh, gone through the dot bomb uh, dot com era and they were like trying to like uh, make everything hooked into the blockchain i don't know if you looked at the exhibitors but we had uh, exotic cars that were going to be tokenized we had uh, virtual uh, augmentation or ar augmented reality glasses we had like a bunch of stuff a travel sherpa site they were tokenizing <laughs> I mean, like I didn't I didn't see dentist coin there, but uh, I know there is one called Denta coin. That yeah. is a coin for dentists. Uh, my teeth are hurting just thinking about it. I just came from the dentist today. Luckily, no, nothing necessary. But yeah, like I mean, Jeff, this is like uh, this is the exact same thing as the dot bomb boom of 2000 that you personally and painfully experienced yourself. It's exactly the same. I told people three weeks ago. Take, sell half your Bitcoin. It's going to go to infinity, so you'll have half of infinity. Half of infinity is better than zero, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I did the same thing at the Dollar Vigilante newsletter for the last two months, or maybe even almost close to three months now. I've been saying, take profits. This is a, you know, you just saw that huge spike that happened basically in the last two months of 2017, mm -hmm. because really Bitcoin was around uh, $9,000 about uh, two months ago. Um, uh, and then before that, of course, you go back a year, Bitcoin was around $1,000 a year I ago know. today. So it's gone up a lot. It went up tremendously. A lot of these other altcoins went up a lot. 
and you have it totally correct that a, a lot of uh, people just started tokenizing everything, blockchaining everything. It was very similar, as you pointed out, to the dot com bubble. And and I'm not talking about it like it's the past; it's still ongoing. And it, this might not be the end of the bubble, by the way. We might, this might still be just another major pullback in it. Uh, but I remember during the dot com bubble, everyone just you would see mining companies up in Vancouver, Canada, all of a sudden change from being yeah. silver mining companies, and they just add a dot com to the end of their name and their stock would go up 500%. It, it's very similar to that. Uh, yeah. But we should point out again that all of this is caused by the central banks and their money printing. And the central banks, not just the Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank, all central banks have been printing money at unheard of historic levels since 2008. So it's sort of funny when you see central bankers and Keynesian economists like Paul Krugman of the New York Times pointing out that this is a bubble and it's bad. It's like, well, all the things that you guys support and, and are, are backers of cause all these bubbles. They don't seem to ever understand that part of it. Yeah. Well, no, because bubbles just happen because of animal spirits. There's <laughs> right, nothing to do spirits. with government policy and policies that encourage bad behavior and mindless behavior. So looking at this bubble, my guess is it's probably going to go down to somewhere at 2,500 to 4,000 is my guess. It's going to pull back 80 to 90 percent. And then we're going to get a post Mount Gox situation. It won't last as long, but post Mount Gox, Bitcoin went down. I remember a guy I deal with, uh, he said, buy it at 187, which is the exact same price that I bought gold at in 2000. I mean, in 1999. And I think uh, you're going to see it in that $2,500 range. And everybody thinks it's finished all the uh, big mines. But I think that there are other cryptocurrencies that are going to perform far greater than Bitcoin. Uh, did you see any interesting currencies? That, well, I hate to call them currencies. They're not currencies. I don't know that they're ever going to be currencies. Do you see anything? What other cryptos are you looking at or have you looked at? Well, I should start by saying that Bitcoin itself has a lot of problems itself. We're still in the very early stages of what's going on here. And because of the decentralized nature of all of these things, and especially Bitcoin, there is there's no one running Bitcoin. There's no Bitcoin CEO. There's no Bitcoin company. And that's all good because if there was, they'd already be in jail and they'd already be shut down by the government. So this is the good part of it. The bad yeah. part is there's not a lot of really good organization to it. And we've been seeing that in the last year with Bitcoin. So what we've seen is with people... Uh, uh, really catching on to Bitcoin, a lot of people hearing about it. So it became like a buzzword in the last year. And a lot of people started to mildly look into it, as you pointed out. Most people still have no idea what it is, but they they, they at least know the, the word and know that they want to invest in it, at least up until a couple months ago. Uh, but uh, the you know the, this is still brand new in so many ways. And so many people are trying to uh, do certain things with Bitcoin. And because all those people started coming into it, it actually overloaded the Bitcoin network. So what we've had over the last year is something called... Uh, essentially the scaling debate. How are we going to make it so that Bitcoin can handle a lot more transactions? And uh, the easy way to do it would have been just to increase the block size, which is why we have the Bitcoin fork in August 1st uh, to turn into Bitcoin cash, because some people believe that was the best way forward. And some other people said, no, keep it at one megabit, which is what you can hold on a floppy disk from the 1980s. Yeah. That's essentially what Bitcoin runs on. For anyone out there who doesn't know, it runs on a floppy disk. And uh, keep it that way. And then we'll create all these really uh, intricate side chains, which block stream profits off of and uh, it, that in, in a year or two it'll get faster and it'll be cheap again well in these sort of markets uh, even waiting a month is too long and so I think Bitcoin has had a lot of missteps in the last year so Bitcoin itself has problems so this gets around to your question of what other alternatives are there and this is something I've been considering a lot because Bitcoin itself as we know it today is never intended to be an actual currency they actually have changed the entire idea of Bitcoin uh, the Bitcoin core and, and the people People that uh, are support it have said, well, we don't really want it to be a currency, which to me is, you know, that's, I don't even want to hear about it after that, because that was the whole point of this whole thing. That's the only way we can get rid of central banks is to create a currency that everyone in the world can use. But they say, no, we'll, we'll make a, it's going to be digital gold now, and it's just going to be really secure. And, you know, it'll still be expensive to transfer, and it'll still take quite a bit of time to transfer, but it'll be very secure. Well, if that's the case, then we do still need a digital cash. So what are the other alternatives out there? Of course, there's Bitcoin cash, which uh, forked off on August 1st. Uh, so, and it's, uh, you know, infinitely cheaper and uh, quite a bit faster than Bitcoin right now. And then there's all these other ones. So you have Litecoin, uh, then there's um, uh, Dash, uh, which is quite interesting, because part of the reason I said that Bitcoin has problems is because there is no real 
anyone running it. There's no marketing department or anything. Dash actually is set up in such a way that they use a certain percentage of the amount of cryptocurrency mined to actually invest in the currency, whether it be marketing and, and things like that. And the people who hold the currency actually get to vote on what it gets used for. So that's interesting. And then the whole other thing that really interests me are privacy coins, because really what we're looking at here is the entire world going towards digital currencies. You're seeing the central banks talking about it. They talk down Bitcoin, but they talk up blockchain and they talk about probably creating their own digital cryptocurrency in the future. We've already seen Venezuela start off with their own. And uh, if we get to that point where we have these big governments, uh, perhaps a one world government, which is where it's all, uh, they're trying to make it go in that direction uh, with a one world central bank and a one world cryptocurrency, which is run by them, which they can inflate at will and they can control and they can see every transaction and tax it. We'll have tyranny on earth like we've never known it. But if we can have a currency that no one knows if you even own and no one can tell it, uh, any of the transactions, and that's currencies like Monero and Zcash and a few others, uh, then uh, we have the still the opportunity for freedom and getting rid of central banks. So this is an ongoing massive war that I've been kind of in the middle yeah. of uh, for a number of years now. And it's just really getting started. And uh, it's going to be very interesting. So this whole uh, uh, cryptocurrency crash is just one small side note to everything that's going on. And I'd like to point out that to me, the most exciting application, I mean, there's a lot of exciting applications of the blockchain, getting rid of stock markets and the parasites associated with those markets, uh, getting rid of all these markets. But the concept of protecting your assets, you know, I've fallen victim to it myself of uh, plaintiffs, trial lawyers. They can sue you for any reason in the world. But if all your uh, all your wealth is tied up in the blockchain, and obviously I wouldn't have wanted to have bought it at 20000 and to be looking at it now because that could be worse than what the lawyer was going to do. <laughs> but if you're spread out, diversified, not keeping it in exchanges, you know, short of them putting a gun to your head to get your to get your key, they're not going to be able to get that money. Nobody, the IRS can't, you know, all they could do is lock you up for contempt. And after a while, they have to let you go for that, unless you're Martin Armstrong, in which case they could keep you there for 11 and a half years. So asset protection is major. We've got some strategies dealing with that. Perhaps you and I should do some work on it. But I really see, because look, you get into a car accident and some idiot is walking on your driveway and trips, hits his head, gets a subdural hematoma, and you have a multi-million dollar umbrella and it's not enough. And believe me, I've been involved in asset protection my entire legal career and there was no good way to do it where you still controlled it and you didn't have to ship it off to some hellhole in some other country and hope that they didn't screw you. Here you can control the currency, control your units and not give them up. So that's exciting to me. And then the idea of getting rid of the securities markets is an idea whose time has come. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you brought up so many uh, great applications of, of what can be used with this technology, and that's why it's not going away. I personally uh, never feel safer than when I have a, at least a sizable amount of my assets in cryptocurrencies, even if they're going to be volatile, because I know for the exact same reason you said, no government can come and seize it. They can't tax it away. Uh, they can't, uh, if you unfortunately have to live in the U.S. So that today with all the legal, as you just pointed out, it's absolutely out of control in the U.S. If you have assets in the U.S., uh, you'd be almost crazy not to at least be looking at cryptocurrencies as a way of protection. And so that's just one uh, uh, thing that you can do with these things. And you pointed out, yes, you can absolutely, there's there's people working on cryptocurrencies and blockchains that will make stock markets essentially obsolete, get rid of all the middlemen, it'll all be just peer-to-peer -peer transactions, which will just make things better for your average person. And, and we just pointed out with money, that's essentially giving the power of money back to the people. It's, it's, it's very similar to gold, and that's why it does get compared to gold a lot, except for in this digital age and in this today's age of, of with all these governments around the world. That uh, There was one man last year who was trying to take a million dollars worth of gold from Italy to Switzerland, and the cops found it, and they seized it because, for whatever reason, uh, basically yeah. stole it. And this happens all the time, but with cryptocurrencies, they can't. You can actually hold it all in your own brain if you want. So this is absolutely massive, empowering uh, technology, and there's so many new applications all coming out. Now, there's lots of really crappy ones that we talked about a number of them, one, number of them early, uh, Sherpa yeah. coin or Dentacoin or whatever. I, I haven't looked into any 
these. Maybe they're good or not, but it doesn't sound too good to me. But uh, there is other people working on things to uh, tokenize the stock, stocks, tokenize uh, the transfer of, of equities, um, all kinds of applications. So uh, going back to what I originally started on, Kerry, this is so similar to me to the tech bubble in the 90s, because if you asked me, and I didn't know anything about central banks, I actually had to learn everything about central banks after I lost hundreds of millions of dollars after my dot-com company right. imploded. Uh, someone passed me the book, The Creature from Jekyll Island, and, and then I started looking yeah. into it. And that's actually led me to do what I do today, which is trying to get rid of central banks and governments across the world, because I see them as the biggest threat to humanity. And it was so similar back then. It was, uh, if you asked me in, in like 1999, 2000, I remember what I said. People said, what do you think about, you know, the internet, so, you know, and these internet stocks? And I, I said, <laughs> you know, a lot of these seem like they're really high. They have no revenue. I don't know where the top is. And I, you know, looking back with what I know now, I would have said, this is probably a bubble due to central bank printing. But I said, even back then, I said, I'm sure many of these companies won't be around a couple of years from now. But this yeah. technology, the internet is not going going away. And I definitely haven't been wrong on that one so far. And I feel the exact same way about crypt cryptocurrencies. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same. The analog is perfect because we're in like 2000, you know, the dot-com bust. But a lot of these great companies, well, I use great in quotes because we all know what they're about, like Facebook, like uh, Google and uh, Apple and, but they're not so much a dot-com company, but, but they're a beneficiary, certainly, of the internet. I don't know that they'd be where they are without what happened in the uh, in the 2000 bust. And so many of these companies are just, you know, powerhouses, behemoths, as a result of that time period. And we like to forget about the ones that, uh, you know, that totally vaporized, like your AOLs. That one just kind of like, it's still around. You always laugh when you see somebody who has an AOL email address, you know, <laughs> it's like, they're going <laughs> to yeah, get rid of it. Every now and then. <laughs> yeah. Every now and then you still see it. My sister's got one, but, <laughs> but you know, the, uh, you're exactly right. I mean, that's where we're at today. So what about on the uh, home front here with central banks and stock markets? Well, they're pulling back a little now. My guess is they're still going to go higher. What are you seeing? The ultimate collapse we thought was going to happen a long time earlier, and yet they keep managing to put it off and put it off. What I've learned uh, in the last few decades is that these collapses are generally planned. And if I did a lot of research looking back into them, this goes all the way back to the Great Depression. That was a planned collapse. It was the central bank. Uh, it, the people who control the central bank inflated the money supply massively after they went off of, after they created the Federal Reserve in 1913. And uh, they created this massive bubble and they knew exactly what they're doing. And they rescinded the money supply in 1929. They knew it would cl crash the markets and they were all ready for it. And when it all crashed, they bought up everything at pennies on the dollar. Uh, this happens over and over and over throughout history. So it's rather funny that a lot of people actually watch people like Ben Bernanke and Janet Yellen and actually think they're like decent people. It's like, no, these are the people who are screwing everything up constantly. It's not even necessarily Ben or Janet because they, they're they basically just puppets. They probably don't even know what's actually going on behind the scenes. But this goes on and on. 2001 was the exact same thing. Uh, then 2008, it actually, both, both of those actually fell on a certain uh, date called called the Shemitah date, the right. exact day, which is every seven years, which I figured out uh, you know, after the fact. But uh, when you look back at it, it's quite amazing. September 20, I forget the exact date, uh, September of, of 2008, on the exact end day of the Shemitah, which happens every seven years, uh, and, and uh, it, the Shemitah is very tied in with number seven, the stock market fell that day, the Dow, 777.7 .7 points. And the reason I bring this up is uh, we've now seen, we've had this, uh, we've gone beyond the Shemitah period now, we've gone beyond even what the, comes after that every 50 years, the Jubilee. And I've been actually just waiting. I actually said, I think uh, there's going to be a time and and they're, they're going to have a certain date sort of picked. And I, I've been focusing lately on 2018 because the front cover of the Rothschild owned Economist magazine in 1988 said, get ready for a new world currency. And it had a phoenix with all the currencies, the dollar, the yen, everything burning below it. And around its neck was a gold coin, which said 2018 on it. And so I 
I, I've been thinking, okay, maybe 2018 is the time. And the reason I bring this up is it was just a few days ago on Friday, which was the 33rd day of the year, which is a very occult number for the Freemasons. The Freemasons have mm-hmm. set up everything that we know of. The entire U.S. government is uh, all Freemasons set up, all George Washington, everything. The whole entire city of Washington, D.C. is set up with all Freemasonry symbols. It's all Freemasonic, and, and their biggest number is 33. So on the 33rd day of the year this year, which was, I believe, February 2nd, the Dow Jones fell 666 points, another yeah. kind of what well-known a coincidence. number. What a coincidence, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think this is a signal that this something's in play now, and I'm not sure what it is. But as you pointed out, just looking at every number, every economic stat, every financial number, the U.S. government now over $20 trillion in debt. It was only about $8 trillion when Barack Obama came into office uh, in 2008. So it's doubled in the last eight years. Uh, now there's Donald Trump, who's the small government guy, but government spending has not gone down at all. It's actually increased, uh, which is all by design, in my opinion. Uh, so these numbers just are just out of control. I was saying this was crazy a few years ago. Now it's beyond crazy. So now it's just a matter of when. And I think it, it's looking like, according to my analysis, it, it's going to be something massive this year. What it is and how it is, that's up for a lot of speculation. But uh, I would suggest people get prepared for some crazy stuff to happen uh, this year. Yeah, well, it certainly started out as a crazy year. And I think there's a good possibility. Other numbers I've heard bandied around 2021 and 2022, which would kind of fit in with uh, what you were talking about there, the Shemitah every seven years. But every seven years, generally something happens in these markets. And I don't believe that uh, the Dow declining 666 was a coincidence. This is orchestrated, just like we were talking before, all these articles that appeared about cryptocurrencies, about Bitcoin, that they're manipulated on the Times technology section. Worries grow that the price of Bitcoin is being propped up. Surprise. Major banks ban buying Bitcoin with your credit card. What a shock. Even uh, the uh, party that we went to at the North American uh, Bitcoin conference that was in a strip club, anything to delegitimize it. But you see it part of the takedown. But like you said, I don't think this is the final hurrah of uh, Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies by any stretch. And uh, and then the Bitcoin's just going to permeate every, every area, every section of the economy, both domestic and worldwide. But hey, we're just going to have to see what happens next. Jeff, uh, where do we find you at these days? Best place? Uh, dollarvigilante.com is where our newsletter is. And we do a twice monthly newsletter where we talk about all these things. I've been talking about a lot of this stuff in our newsletter in the last few months, especially taking profits on the cryptocurrencies. You can find us on YouTube, Dollar Vigilante. We also have a conference coming up next week in Acapulco, Mexico. It's the world's largest anarcho-capitalist voluntarist conference. Actually sold out now to about 1,500 people called Anarcopoco. But you can actually watch it on uh, live stream at anarcopoco.com slash live stream. And uh, you can also come down. We also have a Dollar Vigilante Summit the day after Narcopoco on February 19th. You can check that out at tdvinvestmentsummit.com. Very cool. Hey, well, be part of the show. Email us, kl at kerrylutz.com. Any questions for Jeff or myself? Any other show you might have heard? The Twitter feed's at Kerry Lutz. The Facebook page is Financial Survival Network. Jeff, we will catch up with you later. Thanks. Thank you, Kerry. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.